desire to be gathered together as a body of faith for the glory of God. As we begin this time of worship and celebration, we're going to sing the song Revival Anthem, declaring that we know that God's Spirit is on the move. He revives the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world that calls upon the name of Jesus and accepts Him as Lord and Savior. And as we do this, uh, it'll be a shout of joy. And as we sing the O's, feel free to jump in and sing the O's with us. And there's some la da 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 It's really fun. So let's stand together and let's praise God together. so thankful for the revival that you have done in our hearts, God. It is all because of you, Lord. God, we can take no credit. Nothing else can take credit for that but the blood, the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you so much for the newness of life in you, and we know that you are uh, working for revival in this land, and we celebrate that, and we look for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Hope you had a wonderful week this past week. Uh, if you have your bulletin, if you'd open up some ministry reminders today, just want to mention a few things. But before I do, I did want to mention that last Sunday we had a couple here in view of a call to work with our youth and our kids ministry. 
and uh, we had a meeting Sunday night, and we voted as a church body to have them come in view of that call. So we will have, they'll be here early, uh, probably mid-September, but I'm very, very excited. Joe will work with our youth and Bethany with our kids, and I believe they're going to do a wonderful, wonderful job. So that's very exciting for, uh, for our church, and you'll learn more about them in the coming weeks. Uh, but in your bulletin there, there's several things I wanted to mention. First of all, we have a ministry fair tonight at 530. Really want to encourage you to be here for that. Two purposes for that. One is so you can find out more about small groups, but also to learn about our ministry teams in different places where you might could plug in and serve in the church. Um, I, Chad, Pastor Chad will be uh, kind of taking care of that tonight. I'll be in Hedinger, North Dakota at our campus. They're leading a service, but you'll be in his capable hands. And by the way, uh, Chad just got back with a mission team from Panama in Central America. So you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks, but I'm very thankful for God's protection and what God did in and through them there. Uh, and I, I know Chad would love to share that with you if you wanted to talk to them about that. But that's tonight at 530. Uh, it's a potluck as well. Would love for you to come just bring some food and hang out and come learn more about different ways you can get plugged in. Uh, also, we have a guest luncheon next Sunday after the second service here. Uh, free lunch for anyone who'd like to come who's relatively new to the church and would like to learn more about uh, the church. We invite you to that luncheon next Sunday. Uh, and then one final thing, you'll notice there the, the one that's titled The Call Family. Um, we, had a, we have a, a, a sweet new family in our church, and uh, uh, Adam was uh, in an accident recently and was burned, had some pretty severe burns, and he's doing really well, but he's been in and out of the, the you know, treatments for that. Uh, and so we have got, gotten a, uh, a meal train together for them. And uh, Mary is back there in the very back. If you just want to wave your hand, Mary, they'll see you back there. But Mary is coordinating that. If you'd like more information on getting a meal to her to get to the call family, uh, please see her after this service. She'll be in the back, uh, back there. All right, I'm going to start out by reading. Have any of you ever heard of a book? It's called The Valley of Vision. It is a collection of Puritan prayers that were found and published. Have any of you ever heard of that or read that? Uh, it's really, really good. It is definitely old English. In fact, in the first service, as I was walking in, one of our greeters out there said, how art thou, sir? And I said, it's interesting you speak in old English because I'm going to read something in old English this morning. And uh, it's a great book. Valley of Vision is what it's called. I encourage you guys, if you're discouraged, to go get this book and just begin to read through it. It's arranged topically. But, uh, but listen to these words. This is a prayer from a, a brother in the faith. We don't know who it was, but it's a prayer that was found from Puritan days from a... Uh, a follower of Christ. And uh, just listen to this. It says, another week has gone and I have been preserved in my going out and in my coming in. Thine has been the vigilance that has turned threatened evils aside. Thine the supplies that have nourished me. Thine the comforts that have indulged me. Thine the relations and friends that have delighted me. Thine the means of grace which have edified me. Thine the book which amidst all of my enjoyments has told me that this is not my rest, that in all Success is one thing alone is needful to love my Savior. Nothing can equal the number of thy mercies but my imperfections and sins. These, O God, I will neither conceal nor palliate, but confess with a broken heart. In what condition would secret reviews of my life leave me were it not for the assurance that with thee alone there is plenteous redemption? For thou art a forgiving God that thou mayest be feared. While I hope for pardon through the blood of the cross, I pray to be clothed with humility, to be quickened in thy way, to be more devoted to thee, to keep the end of my life in view, to be cured of the folly of delay and indecision. I know how frail I am to number my days and to, and to apply my heart unto wisdom. Let's bow our heads right now. Father, right now, we thank you for those great brothers and sisters of the past and even of the present who encourage us, who enrich our lives. God, this morning, I pray that as as the one who prayed this prayer so many generations ago, God, that we will worship you, that we will love you, that we'll, we will apply our hearts unto wisdom as we number our days and understand that every day is given to us as a gift from you. Father, may we enter into this time today of worship with grateful hearts. Lord, as we consider your grace in our lives, we consider your mercy. Lord, later as we take this Lord's Supper and we think about the broken body and the, blood, and the shed blood of Christ, God, I pray that you will be honored and glorified in all we do, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing? How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain 
I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could
we can trust in his leading. He leadeth me, oh blessed thought, oh words with heavenly comfort from whatever I do. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's flowers bloom by waters calm or troubled seas still tears God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me.
trust thee, precious Jesus, sing your friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. you so. God, we thank you for the revival of our hearts, God, the redemption of our souls. God, that you dwell in our hearts, God, that you lead us in this life. God, and I pray daily, God, as we understand your love more, as we get to know you more, Lord, as you reveal more of your awesome wonders to us, that we would trust you more and more, that we would put more of those things that we try to keep in our grasp, Lord, in your hands. God, that we trust you with them. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Uh, we are going to share a video really quick. It's actually two separate small videos. And the video quality, uh, it's not super great because it's very windy that day. We were at Orman Dam last um, Saturday, and we had the chance to baptize uh, two students from our youth group, uh, Ellie Kakuchka and Lexi Allert. Both got baptized last Saturday. Absolutely. Uh, they, they had been planning, you know, we had kind of a string of baptisms here recently, but they had some family in town, and th those two girls are friends, and they wanted to do it together with their families at the lake. And so we waited till we could do that, and just a joy to see what God has done in Ellie and Lexi's lives uh, over the summer and uh, all that God has been doing. And so as we watch this video, we just celebrate the salvation that has happened in their hearts. That is great. I, for, a couple things. First of all, Wendy in South Dakota. I, nah, no, definitely not. Uh, it is, it, as Ashton said, though, it is a joy to see what God is doing in their lives and the lives of our students. Just a lot of neat stuff happening in our youth uh, group right now. So very thankful for all those who volunteer and help in that area. Uh, if you got your Bible this morning, I invite you to open up to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And as you're turning there, um, really quick, I don't want to say this at the end because we have a really worshipful song to finish this service with, but uh, if you're able to just hang around for a couple minutes after this service, we need some help getting some uh, chairs moved out and some tables moved in for our ministry fair tonight. So if any of you are able to help with that, that'd be great uh, after this service. Ephesians chapter 6, as we continue our study through the book of Ephesians, we come to a passage today that uh, at first reading, you're going to say, well, how in the world is this applicable to us today? But it is, and we'll see that in a minute. But Ephesians 6, and then I want to flip over to Colossians and read what I mentioned before was kind of a companion text, very, very similar text uh, to the one that we're in today. So Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9, here's what it says. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, 
and there is no partiality with him. Now, flip over a couple books to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 22, and then we'll read through chapter 4, verse 1. And you'll notice that these are very similar texts here. Verse 22, Colossians 3, 22 says, Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of, your inher- of the inheritance. And then it says this, It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, chapter 4, verse 1, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. All right, as you may know, these letters were both written around 2,000 years ago. And the setting into which they were written contained a culture where slavery was a harsh reality. It was commonplace in that day. It was a driving economic factor in that day. Slavery has been around since almost the beginning of time because man's heart is evil. Our unregenerate hearts desire dominance over others. Our hearts demand our way over others. Now, make no mistake about it. Slavery is an evil, selfish, satanic institution that is in absolute opposition to the will and to the ways of of God. But in these verses that we've come to in our study, Paul does not actually address the evils of slavery. He simply acknowledges it as reality in his day, and then he addresses it in light of that. And he focuses on how the slave was to respond and how the master should act toward the slave. Now, while the Bible does not explicitly condemn slavery, in other words, there's not a verse you can just say, slavery is wrong, period. There's not a, it's not explicit, but it absolutely condemns it in other ways in lots of different places. For example, The Bible teaches that all people are created in the image of God, both rich and poor, regardless of what we have or don't have, regardless of ethnic heritage, regardless of family background, regardless of where a person lives, regardless of handicaps or anything else. We have all been made and molded by the very hand of Almighty God, knit together in our mother's wombs. And then there are so many other passages on how we are to treat others and selflessly love others and defer to others in Christian love, which is... That is obviously opposed to the dominating institution of slavery. Therefore, while the Bible does not explicitly condemn slavery, it absolutely teaches against it. It makes it clear that no one should ever own another person. Slavery was wrong, is wrong, and will always be wrong. It was morally reprehensible in the Old Testament. It was morally reprehensible in the first century world into which this was written. It was morally reprehensible throughout the beginning of our nation It's morally reprehensible today as it unfortunately still exists throughout our world. So we come to a text like this. What do we do with verses like this in Ephesians and in Colossians? How do they apply to us today? If I'm I'm invited to preach at another church or at a conference, I'm probably not going to pick the topic of how a slave is to relate to his master. It's just not something I'm going to... So what do we do with this today? Well, there are a couple of ways that I want to study this passage. The first thing we can do today is this. We can understand that honoring God transcends any and all circumstances that we would find ourselves in. Our circumstances do not have to determine our response. We are in control of that. Just because there are times in our lives where things happen outside of our control, that does not mean that our response to those situations is outside of our control. God wants us to trust Him, to follow Him, to honor Him in all situations, regardless of how bad or how out of control they might seem to us. So in your bulletin, there's an outline in the back if you'd like to follow along. Point number one is this. Identity in Christ, not circumstances, defines the Christian. Identity in Christ, not circumstances, defines the Christian. What are we defined by? Are we defined by circumstances that many times are outside of the scope of our control? And if we are, then we are going to go, we're going to go through life being tossed about by various emotions every time our circumstances changed. Are we defined by bad choices we might have made in the past? Absolutely, we don't have to be. Now, there are consequences associated to past bad mistakes, but we don't have to be defined by those. Are we going to be defined by what others say about us or how the world views us? Are we going to be defined by what we have or by what we don't have? Or, as followers of Jesus Christ, are we going to be defined singularly by our relationship with Him? Paul is writing here and he's telling the Christian slaves who would have read this or maybe had it read to them. He's telling these slaves to honor God even in what seems like an awful situation. And and let's be honest, 
there probably are not too many situations in life that are, wor- that are worse than being a slave. In fact, as best as we can, I want us to think about this text today from the perspective of a first century Christian who is a slave. Think about how profoundly the gospel would have impacted their lives. Think of the hope that it would have brought into an otherwise hopeless situation. Think about the joy that the gospel message would have brought into the despondency of their slavery. Think of the expectation the gospel would have provided of a great eternal future when their present temporal circumstances seem so bleak. Their position in life, unfortunately, was that of being owned by another person. In some cases during this day, slaves were born into that life. In other cases, they would have been sold into this life, possibly even by their family or because of a debt that they owed. But think about how the gospel would have impacted their lives in a situation like this. Think for a minute about what slavery attempts to do to a person and then how the message of Christ addresses that. Slavery obviously attempts to strip away a person's dignity. A slave is not even, not even their own. They are, they are not autonomous from the world's perspective. They are owned by another. They are property of another. And I'm sure that would have been a very easy thing for them to have embraced as being who they were and all they ever would be. To think that society said that that is, that is just their lot in life. It is all they would ever be. And then all of a sudden, people come along or someone comes along, the Apostle Paul or another first century believer, and they share this message, this beautiful, magnificent message of transforming hope, this gospel message. And the first century slave believes and they embrace Christ as Lord. And this message teaches them that they are in reality not slaves, but they are sons and daughters of God. And there is no greater dignity than that. There is no greater thing for a person to hold their head high about in life than knowing that God himself has adopted and accepted them into his family by paying their sin debt. Slavery also attempts to strip freedom from a person. Yet the message of Christ showed them that if they knew Christ, they were actually liberated in the greatest way possible. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 8, if I, if Jesus, if the Son has set you free, then you are indeed free. You see, a slave's temporal circumstance in life was that of bondage, but their eternal spiritual reality was that they were free. Although a slave physically, spiritually, they had been purchased off of the the slave block of their sin by the payment of the Son of God on the cross for them. Slavery attempts to strip worth from a person. Yet the Scriptures teach in places like Psalm 139 that God had more thoughts about these first century slaves than our grains of sand on all the seashores of the world he knew the words they would say before they had even thought about them he knew all the days that were ordained for them that they would live before they had lived even one of them see the world had forgotten about these people the world had forgotten about them but god knew them perfectly the the world saw them as property but god saw them as being valuable enough to send his son to die for them slavery attempts to take away personhood yet for the christian slave their personhood is found in christ the hope of glory. You see, no matter the situation we find ourselves in in life, our identity as Christians is not founded in this old temporal world. And listen, if it is, then in a moment, our identity can be snatched away from us from circumstances outside of our control. I'll give you the example of a pro athlete whose identity is completely wrapped up in their sport and in their, in their athletic ability and the money that they're making. And then all of a sudden, in a second, they have a career-ending injury that stops everything. What then? or the person whose life is wrapped up in their money or their business, and maybe, like today, in the midst of a faltering economy, through no fault of their own, overnight they lose everything, what then? Our identity should not be wrapped up in how others view us. It is not to be wrapped up in our standing in life. It's not to be wrapped up in how things are currently going in life, whether bad or even whether good. But our identity is to be wrapped up in Christ. That's why Colossians 3.3 says that if you're a Christian, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's why 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that you, if you're a Christian, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, redeemed by God. That's why the hymn writer wrote that we have been bought with the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, there is no fear in death, no fear in life. This is the power of Christ in me. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling with this. Maybe your life has not gone the way that you had hoped it would have gone to this point. Broken dreams and pains that have just been seemingly multiplied throughout your life. 
unmet expectations, broken relationships. Maybe things have happened in your life that have left you disheartened and beaten down and you think you just can't take it anymore. And let me just encourage you with this. You are absolutely right. You cannot take it anymore. So quit trying to. And instead, lean on Christ in difficult times. He invites us into his rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I, I myself will give you rest. Whatever trial, whatever hurt you have brought into this room, today view it through the lens of the gospel of who Christ is and who you are in Christ, if indeed you know Christ. Now, I will say this. If you're here today and you're, you've never repented of your sins, never trusted in Christ, you're not a Christian, then your identity is obviously not in Christ. Therefore, it, it has to be in the things of this world. It is in your accomplishments. It is in temporary things. And whether or not you will admit it, you feel the weight of that. You labor under that load. You sense the burden of always trying to, to prove yourself, always trying to find identity and satisfaction and, and joy and things that can never deliver those to you. And that is a tragic and a hopeless place to be, but it does not have to be that way. Christ came to give life and give it abundantly. He came to set us free from our sin. He came to pay our sin debt by shedding his blood on the cross as a payment and as a ransom to secure our spiritual liberation. And if we will simply repent of our sins, trust in him, believing that Jesus, the eternal perfect son of God, came and lived the life we could never live, died on a cross for our sins, and three days later rose again, if you will simply trust in him, you can be forgiven, you can be adopted into his family, you can be given a new identity, a new name in God's family. So the first thing that we can learn from this passage is that identity in Christ, not circumstances, defines the Christian. The second thing that we can do with this passage, and this is typically how it is handled today, is this. We can take the principles of this passage and relate them to our workplace. Relate them to our... So let's do that in our final few minutes together. Look at Ephesians 6, 5 through 8 again. It says, slaves be obedient to your uh, to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one of you does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So this text is reminding us that what drives excellence in life and in this context here, in the, in the workplace, is a desire to glorify God in the way that we work, recognizing that all we do is divinely give an opportunity to honor and worship God. So point number two, as we think about our jobs, we must remember that point number two, what we do does not define us. We've talked about that. Your job, what we have, what we don't have does not define us. What we do does not define us, but it can be used by God to refine us. It can be used by God to refine us. Here is what unfortunately many times happens in life. We will separate the sacred from the secular. And we, have, we compartmentalize. We have file cabinets, so to speak, in our lives. And, and maybe we think of Sunday morning here today or Wednesday nights or small groups or our time with God uh, reading devotionally. We think of that as being our sacred time. And that is our sacred. This should be a time of worship. This should be a time of communion with God. But then when those times are done, often what we'll do is we will then file away the sacred and move on to other things. For example, we might read the Bible, we might pray in the morning, and then we kind of, we kind of set that sacred file aside, so to speak, and we pull out maybe our work file, which is then part of our secular time. So if that is true, if, if only Sunday mornings, only Wednesday nights, only worship, only devotional times, if, if those are our sacred, only, if, if only those things are our sacred time in life, then that means at a minimum... 85% of our lives are consumed by secular and not sacred. Now, that, this is why verse 7 is so important. It says, with goodwill, render service. It says, even in our, in our jobs, in the workplace, the secular, so to speak, world, we are to render service not as to unto men, but unto the Lord. So this verse dispels the myth that there is some sort of division between secular and sacred, and it helps us to think differently about our jobs and really about every, every area of our lives. You see, we need to see every area of our lives, and in this case, in our verses today, we need to see our employment as a divinely given opportunity and even an invitation to worship God and live life on mission for Him in the workplace. We need to see it as a time to, uh, for God to use us, for God to mold us, for God to refine us and to work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Your job 
whatever it might be, whether you are a homemaker or a work in a job, or maybe you're retired and you're just serving other people, whatever, your job was given to you by God. Your job was given to you by God. Now, someone might say right now, well, what in the world did I do to deserve that? Seems like divine punishment to me rather than something good. But could it be that maybe we need a perspective change as it relates to our jobs? God, in his perfect providence, placed you where you are for such a time as this. Maybe in your job, in retirement, looking for a job, stay-at-home mom, whatever the case, let me challenge you to think about your job in several ways. Your job is an opportunity to be refined by God, number one, through service, through service. And this is an incredible form of service because in this companion text in Colossians talking about this, Colossians 3.24 says that it is the Lord Christ whom we ultimately serve. Or as it says here in Ephesians 6, 7, with goodwill render service as to the Lord and not to men. Isn't that an incredible thought? When we work hard at our jobs, when we are joyful there, when we serve our employer, our customer well, this verse tells us that we are ultimately serving Christ himself through that. You say, you know, I've heard people say, I really want to serve Christ. I really want to serve Christ. I, I just want to find ways to serve Christ. So let me just say this, a great place to start is in your workplace if you're not already doing that. Your job is an opportunity to worship God and serve God by representing Him well there. And when we serve others in the name of Jesus, God can use that to mold us, to refine us in His image. The Bible is very clear. Christ said He did not come to be served, but to serve. And the book of Ephesians 5, 1 tells us here to imitate Christ. When we serve others, we are acting like Christ. And God will always use that to refine us. Number two, your job is an opportunity to be refined by God through hard work good old-fashioned hard work, which is lacking in our day and age. Good old-fashioned hard work. Honoring God by working hard, and here's where the refinement comes into this. Working hard, even if it is never noticed, even if it is never rewarded by your company or by your boss. There are times when a person might feel like, you know what, I know the Bible tells me to work hardly as if under the Lord, but I'll be honest with you, I don't really feel like doing that because I do not think my boss or my company deserves my best because when I give my best, they don't notice it, I'm not recognized, they never say thank you. And, and, and that may be totally true, but we have got to realize that God is always worthy of our best and it is He that we are ultimately serving. He is the one that we are serving. The, the, listen to this statement. The hardest workers on the face of the planet should be Christians should be us who know our Lord. Because we have a totally different motivation for working hard. You know, typically we are told to work hard so that we can get ahead, work hard so that we can get a promotion, work hard so that we can make money, that we can climb the ladder, and so to speak. But this passage tells us that those are not the primary reasons for the Christian to work hard. Now, if our identity is wrongly wrapped up in those things, then that will be our primary motivation for working hard. And if it's not noticed, if it's not rewarded, we will then become angry, embittered, and resentful toward our employer. But if our identity is in Christ, then we are to work hard even if we never get noticed, even if we never get a promotion or a raise. Why? Because it is the Lord Christ whom we serve. And because we know verse 8, it tells us here in Ephesians, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord. So what Paul is saying is this, work hard for the Lord. If you're never recognized, it doesn't really matter because one way or the other, God's going to re reward faithful service. So we're to work hard as for the Lord. Number three, your job is an opportunity to be refined by God through evangelism, through evangelism. There are not many things that will refine and stretch us as Christians more than sharing our faith with someone, especially someone we're going to be around all the time. You ever notice that family and coworkers are two of the hardest groups to share your faith with? Because you're around them all the time. And, and it can be very terrifying to try and share Christ with coworkers. I, you know, I try to be a good witness here at church because Chad and Ashton are in a bad place. I do my best to share Christ with them, but, uh, but, but I'm telling you, I'm convinced that it's easier to go on a mission trip to the other side of the world and pop in and share Christ with someone than it is to share Christ with a coworker. Yet one of the greatest mission fields you will ever have is your workplace and your family. <clears throat> you are with your coworkers a lot. You have the opportunity to shine the light of Christ into their lives almost daily. And when we live out our faith, people will notice that. Doesn't mean they're necessarily going to receive Christ and, <clears throat> and follow him, but they'll notice it. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you, Christian, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. <clears throat> and you hear people say, you know, that like, I don't share... I don't want to verbally share Christ with others because my faith is a private thing. Well, listen to what Jesus said here in verse 15. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
And then he said in the Sermon on the Mount here, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When, when we are different, when we have joy, when we work hard, even if not noticed, when, we, when our good works are seen, people are going to take notice of that. You're going to have better rapport to share Christ with him verbally. You'll be refined by God, and God will be glorified. It's a win-win for everyone. And we're called to that. Evangelism is an opportunity to be refined by God and used by God in the workplace. Number four, your job is an opportunity to be refined by God through obedience. Through obedience. You know, we're faced with this choice every day as we go through struggles in the workplace. Maybe it's with a coworker that just has a totally different personality and there's just constant, you know, just struggles in here to not like that person and to, <clears throat> whether it be maybe not liking the job you're asked to do. Maybe you feel like I'm, got a college degree and this is a menial task I shouldn't have to do this whether it's you're not getting any thanks for what you're doing whatever the case as we go through those struggles in the workplace all of that is an opportunity to submit to Christ and to work hard out of simple obedience to him now absolutely we have the option in those moments to get angry or say mean things to that co-worker we don't like or not work hard because we don't like what we're asked to do or or we have the option of seeing all those things as divinely given opportunities to obey God to serve God and to represent him well. And when we choose to do that, we will grow in our faith as we obey. That's part of the process of sanctification and our testimony in the workplace will grow as well in the midst of this. Number five, final point is this. Your job, again, whatever it might be, whatever it looks like for you in this season of your life, your job is an opportunity to be refined by God through gratitude. Gratitude. Just being thankful. You know, I said hard work is missing in our nation today. And I would say gratitude is missing, missing in our nation largely today as well. You know, when we choose to thank God and live lives of gratitude, that glorifies God. And it's just a good, healthy way to live life. God is the one who provided your job. God is the one who provides for your needs. And, and I can say this with complete confidence. No matter who is the most miserable person in this room related to your job today, I can say this, having lived abroad, lived in a third world country and been on mission trips, I can say this with complete confidence. No matter what your job is, there are a majority of people in the world who would gladly switch places with you right now. They would love to have your job. Listen to the stats. 85%, and we are so insulated from this, and I'm thankful that we live in this country. We do. it. Don't hear me wrong. 85% of the world lives on less than $30 per day. 85% of the world lives on less than $30 a day. Two-thirds of the world, if you just found you know, throughout the world, a random three people, two out of those three live on less than $10 per day. And, and one out of every 10 people lives on less than $1.90 per day. You know, I, I'll just take a moment and say this. I am as guilty as anyone in this room probably of complaining about things in our nation right now. And I think we would all say things are, I mean, there's some craziness going on right now without question. But I, I will say this. We are abundantly blessed to live where we live and to have what we have. And we need to thank our benevolent Father in heaven for those things. When we are truly grateful to God for our jobs, it will help us quit viewing work as a place to go. Punch a clock, put in our hours, miserable the whole time, bad attitude, then clock out, go home, hang out with our family, only to go to bed to wake up for another miserable eight hours the next day. That's not what God desires. He wants us to view our work as an opportunity to honor him, to grow in him, and as a platform to show Christ to others. If you will view your job as being a gift from God to provide for your needs, and if you will view it as an opportunity to serve God and others, it will make your time at your job so much better, and it will give you spiritual opportunities with your coworkers. A couple summers ago, uh, I had a really, really bad week. And it's funny, as I was thinking through this, I thought, you know, I just remember this happening. I had a really bad week, but, you know, and, and, and in that week, it was like these things that are happening are the end of the world kind of stuff. And now I look back two years later, I don't even remember what the bad things were that week. Uh, but I, I was just having a really rough week. And uh, I went home one day and, and I, I told my wife, I said, I just need to go play golf alone. And so uh, I went, I just really needed to get away. So I went out to Elkhorn Ridge, which is a beautiful course over in Spearfish. Spearfish. It's, uh, it's doubled its rates over the last three years. I can't play there anymore. I'm not bitter or anything. I'm just kind of letting you know that. Uh, uh, but, I, but I was alone and, and I was on the back nine, which is, was built after, it was built several years after the front nine. It's much more wooded, much more secluded than the front nine. And it was really a gorgeous day outside. And just all of a sudden, as I was sulking, as I was feeling sorry for myself, I just began to look around and notice the beauty around me. It was just one of those days where there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It's just a just beautiful blue sky, very little wind. The trees were beautiful and wildlife, wildlife was all around. And I had 
played around 12 holes, and I'd been so focused on the week that I had that I had missed the beauty that was all around me. And in that moment, God reminded me that even though my week had been bad, God is good and God is faithful. He always is. And my life is good. God used that moment to help change my perspective. And I just want to encourage you, wherever you are today, don't miss the beauty and the blessing and the goodness of God in your life right now because of the things that might seem bad. You know, I've shared this with you guys before. I mean, I love Easter. I love Christmas. Obviously, the spiritual significance of those two holidays. But my favorite holiday every year is Thanksgiving uh, because it's a holiday that is set aside. Literally, it was instituted by Abraham Lincoln and the speech that he gave. It was all about Christ. It was all about thanking our benevolent Father in heaven for all the good that he has done. And it was in the middle of the Civil War, by the way, that this came about. And yet they stopped to say, thank you, God for the bounty that you have given us, for the place that we live. And I just want to say, may we see all that God has graciously given us as tools to be leveraged for his purposes, our jobs, our resources, our time, our friendships, and in all things, may we worship God in gratitude for his mercies in our lives. This is a great place to stop today. In light of this final point of being thankful, we're about to transition into a time of communion a time of thanking God for the greatest gift ever given, the gift of the life of Christ for our spiritual freedom. So I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and prepare. And uh, as you're, just hold tight for a second, I'll invite you up in a minute. But as they're kind of preparing in the back there, I want to just share a little bit about what the Lord's Supper is. Some people call it communion, some Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, first of all, is commanded by Christ. In Luke 22:19, 19, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And this is just like baptism that we saw earlier, the Lord's Supper, in the same way. This is not as a way of just conferring grace. This is not for salvation. The Bible is very clear in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. What what we're about to do here with the Lord's Supper is symbolic. The bread that we are going to take pictures the broken body of Christ on the cross and the juice represents the blood Jesus shed to secure forgiveness for those who believe. We do practice at our church open communion, meaning that if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to partake this with us. You don't have to be a member of our church, for example. If you are not a believer, we do very much encourage you. We don't just encourage you. The Scriptures encourage you. If you don't know Christ as Lord, that you not partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, it, it take this time to contemplate and to consider your relationship with God and what this represents. No one's going to judge you if you don't. I promise you no one's going to probably even notice if you don't. And for those who are Christ followers, I just want us to take a minute and and here in a moment and just kind of bow our heads and ask God if there's any unconfessed, if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives, just confess that to him before we take the Lord's Supper. And here's the reason we do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 30, as Paul was giving instructions on what we are to do here. Paul writes, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. This means someone who doesn't know Christ or a Christian who is just not in right fellowship with him. They have sin in their lives that they have not uh, dealt with and confessed. It says, whoever eats the Lord in this way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. So that's Very serious instruction we find there. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our ushers to come down. And as they're walking down, I want you just to bow your heads for a moment, if you will. And uh, and just say, Lord, is there anything in my life right now that is hindering fellowship with you? And if so, confess that. And if you just don't know Christ as Lord, just contemplate. Take this time to say, God, would you speak to me through this today? And we pray that you'll consider your relationship, uh, consider a relationship with Christ. So in the quietness uh, quietness of this moment, let's just... Ask God to do great things in our heart right now. Father, right now in a spirit of humility, we humbly receive this bread and this juice. And God, we pray that you will receive this as an act of worship. God, as we contemplate 
what Christ did on our behalf on the cross for our sins. As we think about the, the beatings, the torture, the broken body, the shed blood, God, may we in humility recognize this great salvation we have. Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, I pray that this will be a time of contemplation. And for those who do know you, God, I pray this will be a time of worship and renewal. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I rise, strength of God, go before me, lift me up. As I wait, eyes of God, look upon and be my sight. As I wait, heart of God, satisfy and sustain me as I hear of God lead me on and be my guide above and below me before and behind me every eye that sees me Christ be all around me above Christ be all around me as I go, hand of God, my defense by my side as I rest, breath of God, fall upon above and below me before and behind me and every eye that sees me Christ be all around me above and below me before and behind me and every eye that sees me Christ be Corinthians eleven twenty three. the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in verse 25, it says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going we're gonna to finish with a really, really wonderful song that is a song of response Ashton is going to sing, and then we congregationally reply. And this song has allusions, has, has several parts that are from the book of Revelation. And so I want to read this verse to you. It's from Revelation 4.11. It says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. As we sing this song, I encourage you to do so in a spirit of worship. It's easy to get to the end of a service like this and start wrapping up and we're, we're, our mind is out that door there but as much as we can right now let's worship God in this song of response 
And uh, as this song is going or immediately after the service, if anyone needs to talk about anything in this that we've talked about today in the service, if you need to know how to, how, to, how to come to know Christ or if you just need prayer, we'll be in the back back here and we'd love to talk with you about that. But I'm going to ask you if you will to stand and, and just focus singularly on Christ during this final song here. Shadows deepen. We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all we knew? We do. all creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord to be the life within our midst it is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this this together is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the lion of judah who conquered the grave he is david's root the lamb who died the slave is he worthy is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this he Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us?
guys go in peace.